condemnation of the law through Christ. Well, with the, I'm not going to use the word precondition. Uh, the holiness as a fruit of conversion is something that should be seen in true believers. This is the point of Hebrews in its five warnings. The five warnings are directed to people who profess to be believers. So that means genuine believers as well as those who may not prove to be genuine believers at all. But the warnings are for both. And that is because for true believers, the warning serves as a means of grace to make us walk with sobriety in our Christian perseverance. So there must be holiness as a proof and evidence that we truly belong to the Lord. So that is what we mean by without holiness, uh, no one will see the Lord. There will be no beatific vision as it is called in theology unless uh, you live a life of holiness as evidence that you are truly belonging to the Lord. Uh, but it is not salvation by works. It is salvation still by grace, but grace that is comprehensive enough to secure both the conversion at the beginning as well as the perseverance of the saints in the continuation of the Christian life. And it is those who are living in holiness that have the evidence to say that they are the ones who will see the Lord. But that's not salvation by works. Okay, so and another question. Pastor Rob spoke about not bringing up secondary opinions on secondary issues. How will we do this without creating a culture of you live your life, I live mine in the church, hindering discussion regarding biblical principles that may affect our conduct? Well, I think uh, Pastor Rob, as I heard him, uh, is speaking of those things that are not matters that have been pronounced in scriptures as either sin or uh, a matter of moral duty but those matters that are indifferent uh, that is how it is called in theology a diaphora means things indifferent neither sin nor a matter of moral duty uh, you are not required to do it nor are you forbidden from doing it so uh, these are matters that you will not make a, an issue of acceptance into fellowship uh, of brethren. I think that is what Pastor Rob is saying. He's not saying that we cannot discuss them. He's not saying that we cannot call out a brother or sister that you feel may be doing something offensive to others or becoming a stumbling block. But in matters of acceptance into fellowship, it must not be on matters which are uh, what Paul calls uh, doubtful issues. And by doubtful, it, he does not mean uh, he doubts the real, the real uh, essence of these issues, but rather there is no uh, positive pronouncement either way that it is sin or it is a moral duty to do, neither required nor forbidden. Those are matters that should not become the issue of fellowship. How can I confront older brothers in church who I believe are overusing their liberty as Christians without getting angry with me? Well, first of all, let us not equate older as stronger. I wish that were the case, and that's what the writer of Hebrews says. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 6 that you have been so long in the faith you should be doing this but instead you still have to be fed with milk uh, in other words there are Christians who have been long in the faith but have not grown into maturity so let's not equate uh, older in terms of age to being more mature but then in dealing with the older person in terms of age and the senior ones where we are given something that uh, we cannot do 
when we deal with the elderly, according to 1 Timothy 5, even for elders uh, that we do not rebuke in a confrontational, sharp way those who are the elderly, but to admonish them uh, with gentleness. And that is what I am prepared to do with the elderly in our church. They are still to be corrected, but we cannot approach them in a manner that is lacking in respect and courtesy that is deserved by the elderly. Other question? How do we respond when we believe a fellow member's conduct is careless with and even violates other biblical principles, but he insists it falls under his Christian liberty? Well, again, determine whether it is uh, really a matter of Christian liberty and then subject it to the principles of moderation I have stated in my address. Uh, measure it by the religious and moral or ethical context, uh, the matter of his personal and spiritual uh, constraints, then if he is becoming a stumbling block to others, as well as the matter of his gospel witness. So in other words, Christian liberty is not period, end of discussion. It is Christian liberty, yes, but is that Christian liberty something you can enjoy without any transgression of the higher ends? Or is that Christian liberty calling on you because of higher ends to self-denial? So you have here the matter of Christian liberty is not end of discussion, but rather Christian liberty, what now? Uh, exercise it? or deny yourself because of higher ends uh, and that's a question that should be uh, that matters of liberty should be subjected to we indeed need to consider the four matters in christian moderation but what could be possible situations when it is right and godly course of action to insist on our liberty in christ paul uh, an example he gives is uh, paul circumcising timothy for the sake of uh, his ministry to the Jews, but also adamantly refusing to circumcise Titus. Well, I explained this yesterday. Uh, the Jewish laws, Paul permitted their exercise by Jews who became Christians with a national symbolism for them. In fact, the Apostle Paul himself subjected himself in Acts to certain Jewish customs as advised by the brethren of Jerusalem in order to be more acceptable to the Jews he was seeking to win. But in the case of Titus, so that's the reason why Timothy was circumcised. Timothy was Jewish. His mother was Jewish. Uh, but Titus was fully Gentile. And when the Judaizers wanted Titus to be circumcised as a matter of binding rule to be fully accepted, Paul refused. And the stated reason in Galatians 2.14 is they are not straightforward in the gospel. And the, for the Apostle Paul, that is compromise of the gospel if you add anything uh, that is a rule, for full acceptance in the case of Gentiles. Now, as I have explained yesterday, by the time of the scattering of the Jews, there was no longer any defined nation of Israel uh, which would justify the perpetuity of the uh, Jewish laws, uh, practicing Jewish laws. And so by the time that you have, by the second, third centuries, you you do not even have the Jewish purpose of practicing those customs which have a national symbolism uh, that is practically all, all gone. And the Israel of today is not the Israel of the biblical identity. Uh, 
as a follow-up question from the Q&A session earlier, is it true that the Puritans didn't observe Christmas? If yes, what was their thinking then? Well, as a matter of fact, they did not observe Christmas. Not only that, when Oliver Cromwell became Lord Protector of England uh, after the Civil War, he in fact issued a law forbidding the observance of Christmas and other holidays. Uh, do I agree with that? No, uh, that's wrong. Uh, you should neither impose nor forbid a matter of liberty. And this goes through of the church, as I was saying, the, way, the best way to safeguard liberty in the church is not to impose something which is a matter of, uh, which is not a matter of biblical command, New Testament command, and that includes Christmas. I personally do not celebrate Christmas as a matter of personal persuasion, but I would not uh, reject a brother or a church that does so. But I, it is my persuasion that the best safeguard to liberty is not to impose on the church anything that the New Testament does not command. Okay, other questions? Okay, one more question. I am a graphic artist being made to work to serve the gay community, promotional materials in our office of which I don't and would not support as a Christian. But to refuse to be productive would cost me my job. What will I do? My survival is at stake, but I'm conscience stricken. Well, first of all, the matter of homosexuality is not a matter of liberty. It is sin. It is clearly condemned in Scripture, both Old Testament and New Testament. And to make a case for continuing to do something that serves the homosexual cause uh, because your job is at stake, that is not a new thing. Some principled Christians in America lost their job because they would not bake a cake for a gay wedding or serve flowers to a gay wedding and they were willing to put their uh, they were willing to make a step of conscience so that is my challenge uh, are you going to just fold your conscience just to keep your job or will you make a step of conscience because there are matters that you will not do uh, for the honor of Christ. And that's my challenge uh, to anyone who is in a similarly situated uh, predicament where you are required to do something that is against your conscience. And to do anything against conscience is sin. So thank you very much.